From Gordon Ramsay's fiery ordeal with gasoline, Bjork's terrifying real-life horror story, and Bono and Jimmy Buffett's high-flying brush with drug cartels, these and other celebrities almost met death head-on. In 2011, Gordon Ramsay traveled to Costa Rica to film Shark Bait, a segment for the Channel 4 series Big Fish Fight. The show aimed to expose some of the harmful practices of the fishing industry. Ramsay's specific focus was on the gruesome practice of shark hunting, in which hunters catch sharks, remove their fins, and leave them to suffer and die. During filming, Ramsay went head-to-head -head with one group of the Taiwanese shark fin smugglers who didn't approve of having him and his camera crew anywhere near their activities. Ramsay reported to The Telegraph, It's a multi-billion dollar industry, completely unregulated. We traced some of the biggest culprits to Costa Rica. The day before we got there, a Taiwanese crew landed a haul of hammerhead sharks. Police searched the boat and found bales of cocaine. These were no small-time criminals, and when Ramsay persisted in trying to film their operations, he stumbled on thousands and thousands of shark fins drying on a series of rooftops, all destined to become ingredients in shark fin soup. Things came to a head when gang members doused him with a barrel of gasoline. Later, after he and his crew managed to talk their way onto another boat, they were forced to stand against a wall and threatened at gunpoint. That's when the police showed up again and ordered them to leave the country. Let's get the out of here. We're going, we're going. Yeah, yeah, we're going. In December 2012, reports emerged of a murder plot targeting Justin Bieber. More details were released in February 2013. According to ABC News, the whole thing was orchestrated by Dana Martin, an inmate at the Southern New Mexico Correctional Facility. Martin was serving a 978-year sentence for murder and rape when he contacted former associates to start planning. Authorities taped phone conversations between Martin and his associates, Mark Stake and Tanner Ruane, and it included some gruesome details. In the phone calls, Martin gave Stake and Ruane directions on how to strangle Bieber with a scarf and how they would castrate both Bieber and his bodyguard with hedge clippers. This is what we see in people who would, we would characterize as a sociopath. The duo reportedly planned to kill four people, but before they could get started on their murder spree, Stake and Ruane were arrested after accidentally crossing the border into Canada. According to CNN, they were in Vermont when they took a wrong turn that led them into a confrontation with U.S. Border Patrol. Stake was arrested immediately, and when Ruane was released, he called Martin to tell him what was going on. Even though they spoke in code, the call was recorded, and Ruane was arrested for conspiracy to commit both murder and aggravated battery. Despite his status as one of the most legendary music figures of all time, it wasn't until 2008 that revelations emerged of an assassination plot targeting Mick Jagger. The BBC documentary The FBI at 100 finally brought the details to light, with host Tom Mangold revealing that the plot was fueled by events at the infamous Altamont concert. In 1969, the Rolling Stones held their Altamont Speedway Free concert, and organizers for security hired the Hells Angels. Rolling Stone magazine reported that the band members initially refused to play when they found out just what the arrangements were, but knowing that would lead to rioting, they tried to go out and play with the intention of closing the whole thing down before things went south. Obviously, that didn't happen. By the time the concert was over, four people were dead. One of the dead was 18-year-old Meredith Hunter. When Mick Jagger made his disgust perfectly well-known, the Hells Angels decided he needed to be taken out. To execute the elaborate plan, members of the gang got on a boat to approach Jagger's Hampton home from the seafront to dodge security. Miraculously, a freak storm caused the boat to capsize. While the would-be assassin survived, they abandoned the plan to kill Jagger, who never even knew he'd been targeted. You can't always get what you want. In an eerie turn of events, on the 30th of December 1999, a man managed to climb over the wall of the 34-acre estate owned by George Harrison. This ingenious intruder made it all the way to the house without triggering any security alarms or lights. It was only when the glass shattered that the former Beatle and his wife were stunned out of their sleep and found he was there. The following day, The Guardian featured an alarming report on the distressing sequence of events. Harrison called a housekeeper living on the estate who then phoned the police. By the time the police arrived, they found Harrison had been stabbed several times as he fought with intruder Michael Abram. It was Harrison's wife, Olivia, who put an end to the fight, knocking Abram out with a lamp. When paramedics finally got to the scene, they found out how close Harrison really was to dying. 
the knife had missed his heart by inches. According to The Guardian, the would-be assassin was a recovering heroin addict who had gone through phases of being obsessed with different musicians. At the time, it was the Beatles. Despite being taken care of by psychiatrists, he was known around his area as being eccentric. As his mother described him, he started to wear a Walkman to play music to stop the voices in his head. In 2002, the BBC reported that he issued an apology in the wake of what was seemingly a bizarre sentencing, or lack thereof. His 2000 trial found him not guilty of attempted murder on insanity charges, and he was sent to a medical facility. He was released from the facility in 2002, saying, I can only hope the Harrison family might somehow find it in their hearts to accept my apologies. I am ashamed of what I did and deeply sorry it happened. The Harrison family was less sympathetic, with Olivia and their son issuing a statement saying, We can never forget how brutally close Abram came to killing dear George and myself, nor the trauma inflicted on our son and family. We always had to watch ourselves. Yeah. Uh, because if we weren't watching ourselves, there was somebody else out there who was. No matter who you are, your home should be a private sanctuary. That's what makes Sandra Bullock's confrontation with stalker Joshua James Corbett all the more terrifying. According to USA Today, he broke into her home on June 8, 2014, after spending several days on the outskirts of her property. Us Weekly reported that Bullock first ran into Corbett when she was coming out of the bathroom after getting ready for bed, meaning it was impossible to tell whether or not he had been standing there the whole time she was showering. Hello? He had with him a notebook, where he had written extensively about his obsessive love for her. When he broke into her home, he had a letter with him, proclaiming his love and signed, Always and forever, love your husband. News.com Australia released the 911 call Bullock made from her closet, where she hid after spotting the stranger in her home. The call also gave further details about the journal Corbett was keeping. In it, he wrote not only about his love, but his desire to have sex with her and a careful chronicle of all the security features she had in her home. Even though he wasn't armed when he broke in, he was also charged with possession of illegal assault weapons, machine guns, and tracer ammunition. Larry Flint is the controversial mastermind behind Hustler magazine, and he was fighting obscenity charges in a Georgia court when he was shot on March 6, 1978. The gunshots sent him to intensive care, and he was ultimately paralyzed from the waist down. Oh, I would like to inflict the same kind of punishment on him that he did on me. I said, I'd give me a pearl wire purse and a screwdriver, and I could really uh, have some fun. The gunman, Joseph Paul Franklin, wasn't caught until a few years later. He initially was arrested for his connection to the murder of an interracial couple, but upon his arrest, his secrets started spilling out. His attempt to kill Flint was only one in his long list of crimes, which were all racially motivated. In 2013, Flint penned a piece for The Hollywood Reporter where he talked about whether or not his would-be murderer should face the death penalty. According to Flint himself, Franklin had shot him because of one specific spread that he had chosen to run in Hustler, featuring a white woman with a black man. For Franklin, who once told CNN he was trying to start a race war, that was all the reason he needed to target Flint. After Franklin's conviction, he started serving consecutive life sentences amassed during his three-year murder spree. He never served most of those years, though, as he was executed via lethal injection on November 20, 2013. One of the most outspoken opponents of his execution was Flint, who wrote, I do not want to kill him, nor do I want to see him die. As I see it, the sole motivating factor behind the death penalty is vengeance, not justice. And I firmly believe that a government that forbids killing among its citizens should not be in the business of killing people itself. In 1998, Jonathan Norman was sentenced to 25 years in prison for his plot to break into the home of Steven Spielberg, take his family hostage, and do some pretty terrible things to the director himself. The BBC reported that Spielberg spoke to the court about what he believes would have happened if his killer confronted him, adding, I genuinely in my heart of hearts believe that I would have been raped or maimed or killed. If he's out on the street, I will live in fear. I place myself in your hands. The prospect that Jonathan Norman might have another opportunity to carry out his threats is beyond frightening to me. And I want to be able to, you tell my story so, so that story can inform everybody about what happened to me. Norman had been arrested after two attempts at breaking into Spielberg's Pacific Palisades estate. That was in 1997, and when he made his attempts, he had with him duct tape, handcuffs, and a knife. Spielberg wasn't home at the time, reported the LA Times, and that didn't make Norman's actions less terrifying. He even went as far as leasing the same car as Spielberg's wife, and he hoped to use it to get past security. Even though Norman 
Simmons' lawyers tried arguing that he was only getting a stiff penalty because his target was famous, his previous felony convictions allowed the courts to hand out the max penalty with a guilty verdict. In 2011, Kevin Liverpool and Junior Bradshaw were apprehended by police after suspicious behavior. Upon their arrest, police discovered the men were armed with swords, a body bag, and rope. Two years later, they were found guilty of plotting to kill Joss Stone, a British singer-songwriter. It's terrifying. The men had driven from Manchester to Stone's home in East Devon with a detailed plan to first kill her and then dispose of the body in a nearby river. Handwritten notes detailing their plan were found soon after their arrest. The motive was believed to be fueled by Stone's connection to the British royal family and her friendship with Prince William. While en route to Stone's home in Devon, the suspects were eventually involved in an incident with police in Gloucestershire. They had fled a gas station without paying, but the police were unaware of the weapons and the theft, so they allowed them to proceed. Stone was home at the time the two men were asking neighbors for directions to her house. Once the police noticed their suspicious activity, they apprehended them. According to Detective Sergeant Martin Sutcliffe of the Devon and Cornwall police, the contents of their car said everything about their intentions. The men had packed it with hammers, knives, garbage bags, duct tape, hose, and swords. In 1982, Arthur Richard Jackson attempted to murder actress Teresa Saldana shortly after her notable performance as Joe Pesci's wife in Raging Bull. Despite the traumatic experience, Saldana persevered and went on to achieve a successful career in television, gaining recognition for her role as the protagonist's wife in The Comish. However, the attack had a significant impact, resulting in changes to stalking laws across the United States. In 2004, she sat down with Larry King to tell the story of just what happened that day. Jackson had tracked her down by calling her mother and pretending to be Martin Scorsese's assistant, looking for her address. Her unsuspecting mother gave out the information, and that was when Saldana's manager first alerted her to the fact that someone was stalking her. Jackson spent 18 months tracking her down, finally confronting her at 10 a.m. on the streets of L.A. After confirming her identity, he started to stab her. By the time a bystander named Jeff Fenn was able to subdue him, she had been stabbed 10 times. Jackson was arrested and sentenced to the maximum 12 years. The L.A. Times later reported that he was up for parole in 1989 and had his sentence reduced because of good behavior. This happened in spite of the fact that he had continued to write about his intentions to kill Saldana when he was released, calling himself the benevolent angel of death and saying it was his destiny to take her to heaven. That said, Saldana didn't let it get her down. In addition to resuming her acting career, she also became a voice for victims. That sense of rapport and camaraderie really prompted me to feel that this should be something available to victims. Her advocating against his release led to him serving additional time and he was ultimately extradited to England and sentenced to a psychiatric hospital for his involvement in another murder. He died there in 2004, Gizmodo reported. Saldana died in 2016. Singer and songwriter Bjork's life was at risk when her stalker sent her an acid letter bomb. According to Far Out, Ricardo Lopez began liking the singer in 1993. At first, he found a safe place in her music, but it soon turned into an obsession depicted in several tapes in which he talked about his depression and self-loathing as well. When he found out Bjork was dating someone else, he felt betrayed. He made a statement threatening her well-being, saying, I'm just going to have to kill her. I'm going to send a package. I'm going to be sending her to hell. Shortly thereafter, he made the acid letter bomb and sent it to her residence. ABC News reported that in 1996, Lopez's body was found at the age of 21, four days after sending the disguised bomb to Bjork's residence. After the incident, she addressed the media, saying, I make music, but in other terms, you know, people shouldn't take me too literally and get involved involved in my personal life. I make music for people, you see. You just have like a roller coaster ride, you know? The Guardian described 50 Cent's shooting and survival as rap folklore. According to their report, 50 Cent was shot in Queens by three hitmen sent by Kenneth Supreme McGriff, a drug lord who was unhappy with a song written about him. During the trial, it was revealed that after the shooting, they left 50 Cent for dead, and Supreme was celebrating, saying, I got him. After the terrible incident 50 Cent told the donut hole it was a wake-up call, he used it to completely take himself away from the drug scene. When looking back on the incident, 50 Cent shared with Hot 97 regarding his shooting in May 2000, saying, I went through a portion of me actually being afraid. I was hurt physically. The only time I wasn't afraid is when I was actively involved in actually looking for somebody connected to it. Following that, actually being shot, I was like, I was afraid because everybody involved in a situation was still physically available. 
In 2009, when Ryan Seacrest was still part of American Idol, he had to file a restraining order against Chidi Benjamin Uzoma Jr. for stalking the set of the show and the studio for his radio show. According to the Herald Bulletin, the judge granted this petition mere hours after Uzoma was detained. Seacrest gave a statement discussing the restraining order and said, His aggressive and violent efforts to come into physical contact with me are extremely frightening to me. They have jeopardized not only my personal safety, but also the safety and well well-being of those around me. The violent and physical efforts to get in touch with the TV host began in November 2009. The California Criminal Defense Lawyer blog reported that Uzoma first attacked Seacrest's bodyguard with a knife as he tried to get in his car. This is real. Dude, this is what probably... This, this is, is what I'll be known for. <laughs> Uzoma's second incident had to do with him being previously charged for carrying a switchblade knife for assault and for battery. Because he violated the court's orders, he was charged with a felony count of stalking. At the time of his arrest, Uzoma spent the night in jail and was given bail at $150,000. Later, on November 17, 2009, CBS News reported the judge had found in Seacrest's favor and Uzoma had to stay 100 yards away from him. In November 2015, actress Polly Perrette posted a tweet detailing an attack she experienced. In the tweet, Perrette shared that it was awful, life-changing, and how she was grateful to be alive. Attached to the tweet was a photograph of a document describing how a man named William had punched her repeatedly and threatened to kill her. Perrette attempted to save herself by bonding with the man over his name that he shared with her nephew, but he continued to beat her until he eventually told her to leave. In her tweet, Perrette shared that she was able to draw a sketch of the man who attacked her, and her friend took a photo of it to share with the police. When discussing the attacker, Hollywood's LAPD Sergeant Ward said, I've seen this guy's rap sheet. It's a long rap sheet. He's self-medicating, probably didn't even know who she is. He's not going anywhere. In the days following the attack, Perrette shared how she was coping with the trauma, admitting she was experiencing flashbacks and nightmares, tweeting, How am I doing? I'm okay. Not great. Almost being killed. Tough. What I was feeling was my heart was breaking for this man. I mean, that could have been anybody. It happened to be me. In 1976, Bob Marley was the victim of an assassination attempt. While he and his band were rehearsing for an upcoming concert at his home, seven armed men broke in and opened fire. According to Tyrone Downey in a conversation with Far Out, the attack happened while Marley briefly stepped out of the rehearsal room to allow the horn players to practice, saying, He went into the kitchen to get a grapefruit or something, and all of a sudden you see a hand come through the door, like around the door, and start firing this 38. Marley's wife, Rita, and son Ziggy were both in the room during the shooting. Bob was the only one shot in the arm, and Rita was hit in the head by a bullet just an inch away from her brain. That's a, yeah. Went right through? What just No, it. I'm saying lodge inside it. Although the shooting took place on December 3rd, just two days later, Marley and his wife were on the National Heroes Park and Kingston stage performing for the fans who had been waiting for them. Ziggy explained to Face to Face, This is the type of woman that my mother is. Even a bullet in her head couldn't stop her from serving that higher purpose. However, after the concert, they relocated to London, where they took a break from touring. In 1994, Garrett Morris was 57 years old when two men approached him at 12.50 p.m. as he was getting to his car and threatened him, asking for money. Los Angeles Times reported that when Morris told them he had no money, one of the men shot him twice. The spokesperson for the Los Angeles Police Department, Sandra Costello, shared the details of the attempted robbery, explaining it happened on the 6700 block of 10th Avenue. The assailants ran away after shooting Morris, so the police still weren't able to identify them. Morris explained to the Television Academy Foundation that if they came up in front of him, things would have ended differently, explaining if they said, I'm going to shoot you if you don't give me your money. I would have done that. They came from behind. According to the Baltimore Sun, Morris was taken to the Daniel Freeman Memorial Hospital, where he underwent surgery, and doctors announced he would survive the wounds. Morris was shot in his chest and arm. AP News also said that even though doctors expected him to survive, his agent said his injuries were serious. Although Andy Warhol died in February 1987, there had been a previous attempt on his life in 1968. It was that year that radical feminist writer of Scum Manifesto Valerie Solanas shot him in an attempt to murder him. According to the New York Times, Warhol and Solanas met in 1965 when she tried to have him produce her play Up Your Ass. 
Warhol didn't produce said play, but casted Solanus in one of his erotic films. As her relationship with Warhol continued, Solanus began to feel there was a conspiracy in which he was trying to silence and repress her. The day she shot him, Solanus explained that Warhol had too much control over her life. Jose Diaz, curator of the Andy Warhol Museum in Pittsburgh, told History, she, Valerie Solanus, became paranoid that he didn't in fact lose the play, but wanted to keep it, claim it, and make it his own. It's just... I ran out of ideas. After the shooting, Warhol had to wear a surgical corset to help keep his organs in place until the day he died. The aftermath also left him with a fear of hospitals that pushed him to delay a surgery he desperately needed. As Jose Diaz explained, Warhol developed a fear of death. He was always nervous about getting sick. I think death always made him nervous, but of course, having almost died once really escalated that. In 1996, Jamaican police mistook Jimmy Buffett and Bono's plane for a marijuana smuggling aircraft and began shooting at it when it landed. According to Taste of Country, Bono's family, who were also in the plane, had to find cover to stay alive as bullets started spraying through the windshield. Bono's family and the two superstar singers were unhurt by the gunfire, and the Jamaican authorities profusely apologized for almost ending the careers of two of the most famous singers around. When looking back on the incident, Buffett explained, I know that there are times in my life where I probably should have been shot at for a lot worse behavior, but on this particular instance, I was innocent, not even a spliff. Although Buffett told the police to f*** themselves after they tried to apologize for what had happened, and not to waste a good mistaken identity shooting incident, Buffett put pen to paper and wrote the song Jamaica Mistaka, which retells the incident with an upbeat flair.